shares versus property. Which asset class is going to help us build realistic, long-term, growing financial freedom and independence? Let's explore this together right now. everyone to Sugar Mama's Fireplay podcast. I am financial planner Canna Campbell. Today we're going to be talking about shares versus property. We're going to peel back as many layers as possible and talk about all the pros and cons and compare them and help work out what might be the better option for us if we are really determined and focused to build long-term growing and sustainable passive income streams in our lives. Now, as you guys know, I always have to do the general advice warning. All of my content, whether it be a podcast, something you see on my Instagram account or on YouTube, is never personal advice, product advice, or investment advice. It's purely for your education, motivation, and inspiration. So please bear that in mind, particularly for this podcast, because we're really gonna be going into detail of two very, powerful, but also quite different asset classes. So bear that in mind. Also in this podcast, I may share with you, or I hope I do share with you, I guess some of my personal experiences and perhaps opinions, but not in a bad way or a good way or an advice way whatsoever. So again, please bear this in mind that this is not, I'm not telling you you should buy this property or invest in in this stock, far from it. It's purely just to give you a bit of an insight into my journey and my experience. It's not to, to you know, advise you or to not advise you. It's just to guess, share with you what's going on in my world and, and, and how I've gotten to where I am today and where I'm going. Because like you, I'm on my own path of building financial freedom and independence. It's something I'm really passionate about as a financial planner. And I really believe a good financial planner is doing the same. They're, they're marching to the beat of their own drum. And what I think is really important about a financial planner that's actually doing their own work is they get, like well, I get the frustrations, I get the setbacks and I get the challenges. I'm not immune from all of those things. So when I get a DM from someone saying, oh, this is so annoying, I'm so upset this happened, I get it. I've probably had that happen to me before. And hopefully that's the value of my content is it comes from a huge amount of experience and I guess uh, both financially, professionally, and personally. But the other cool thing is about me working on my own financial goals and my own journey and and sharing and hopefully inspiring you along the way is I also get the the feeling of progress. And I always say progress feels success and the feeling of wins, no matter how big or how small. But best of all, and this is what's best, I get the incredible feeling of pride that pride and satisfaction when you look at something you've done and you step back and go, wow, I did it. And it helps build your sense of self-worth and self-confidence. And it's also an act, I believe, financial well-being and taking your financial well-being seriously, an element of self-love. So no matter what your goals are, no matter how small they are, no how like how big they might be, whether they're short-term goals or long-term goals, I get it. And hopefully I'm holding your hand along the way by sharing with you what's going on in my world. And I'm hopefully helping you achieve your goals and dreams. Now, today we're talking about shares versus property. So there's two little things I want to talk to you about quickly before we launch into these, because there's an important, I guess, concept I really want you to understand, because at the end of this podcast, I will give you a bit of an opinion from my personal experience. But also I want you to understand what I refer to is mind, my, the, what is your mindful money number. Okay, so first of all, I'll touch the mindful money number. All right, so my financial goal is to build a growing passive income stream of $200,000 a year for my family, okay? Tom and I worked out this number and yes, we may over time need to adjust it with the cost of living, inflation, our lifestyle, And of course, always being keeping our finger on the pulse with what the tax rates are. But for the time being, this is what it is. And when I use the word growing passive income stream, it's a really important keyword in this goal. 
So you're probably thinking, okay, I understand what passive income is, but what does kind of really mean by growing passive income? Well, what I mean is building our portfolio with two dimensional assets. Okay. So what does two dimensional assets mean? Okay. Two dimensional assets are assets that grow in value from a capital growth perspective and provide a passive income stream. Now, when you have an asset class that provides capital growth and income, it's what I call a two-dimensional asset. And they can be incredibly powerful in helping you build that passive income stream and very powerful in giving you or helping give you that sustainable financial freedom and independence. Let me explain why. Well, first of all, the growth perspective is capital growth. So I buy a share for $2.50 and then a couple of years later or however long it may be, it's now worth $3. It's had a 50 cent growth, okay? So that is what we call capital growth. The second element being the income. So for example, I have a $2, um, a $2 worth of stock and I receive 10 cents per annum, for example, in, in dividends, which is income. Now the powerful thing when you have a capital growth and an income component is it means that income stream actually grows ideally organically over time. So for example, if you would look at a cash savings account of say $100,000 and it was paying an interest rate of say 4%, that would mean you received a passive income stream of say $4,000 a year there's actually no capital growth component behind it. You've got that $4,000 coming in a year. Yes, technically you could not spend that $4,000 and just bank it. And yes, there would be a compounding uh, interest element to it, but there's no capital growth with an asset class like a, you know, a, a bond or a, a cash savings account typically. The other option is if you looked at, for example, $100,000 worth of shares. Now these are what I, are two-dimensional assets. And examples of, by the way, of two-dimensional two assets are typically international shares, Australian shares, and property, okay? Now, you take that $100,000 of shares and you've invested. Ideally, obviously, with a, over the long run and with a lot of market volatility and educated and informed risks before you made any investment decisions and, of course, got professional advice you ha would have that $100,000 growing in value. So one year it might be worth say $102,000. The following year it would, might be worth $105,000 or $106,000 or whatever it may be, keeping in mind volatility. And of course the other elements like diversification and risk. But at the same time, whilst that portfolio is ideally growing over time, in the meantime, you're still receiving dividends. That is almost, it's the equivalent of like rent, but off your shares. It's a cut of the profits from those businesses. And assuming that the company is doing well and you've made smart, informed, educated investment decisions, those dividends tend to grow each year organically. So the first year, if we use say, you know, depending on a, the return, you got say $2,000 off your $100,000 investment portfolio. And again, I'm just going to assume for simplicity that you take that, you don't reinvest it. The following year, those dividends typically grow over time. And if you look back over history, particularly in the Australian stock market, the average dividend growth for industrial shares on average over the long run, and I'm talking sort of 20, 30, 40 years, is around about sort of three and a half to five percent per annum. Okay, so this is why two dimensional assets that give you capital growth and income, but growing income are incredibly important because it keeps up or helps keep up with inflation. And this is extremely important because if you are trying to build a passive income stream, your mindful money number is say, for example, $80,000 a year, you want to make sure that that $80,000 a year keeps up with inflation or even better beats inflation. So that is why it's so incredibly important to have a component within your risk profile parameters that has this asset class because that quite possibly may be is what allows your portfolio to remain sustainable and keep you in that place where you are financially free and independent. Okay, 
So before I now start dissecting these elements and you get this concept of growing passive income, you have to promise me this. If you are going to be making some serious investment decisions and you are on board with growing your mindful money number and building financial freedom and independence for yourself, you will do number one, a risk profile because shares and property are not for everyone. The second thing is you'll promise you'll go and do is after you've educated yourself, you'll go and get professional personal advice from a financial planner, not a financial influencer that you see online, but someone who actually can sit down, listen to your situation, listen to your time frame, listen to your goals, listen to even your fears and put together personal advice based on your situation, your goals, your dreams and your deadlines. Okay, so you have to promise me this. Now, the next thing what I'm going to do is now move straight on to dissecting these two different asset classes, because as I said, you now understand that they're, they're both two dimensional assets that provide growing passive income. Okay, and they could be a part of your financial strategy. All right, so let's get into this. Now, investment properties we're going to start with. Now, I'm going to assume it's just this is genuine investment property. I'm not talking about your principal place of residence. That is your home. I'm talking about proper, authentic investment properties, whether it be commercial, rural, industrial, or residential. Okay. You've bought them and you've rented them out to earn an income stream. Now I'll start with the upside of property, and then I will move on to the cons of property, and then we'll move on to the positives of shares and the negatives of shares. And I'm going to give you a bit of a background as to my personal experience and my personal insights. So First of all, when I look at investment properties, you know what, it's, it's probably the most loved asset class because it's the most easy to understand and it's a tangible asset. You can stand outside the front of your investment property, say a house or an apartment and go, I own that, that's mine, that's worth X amount of dollars. And it does give you a warm, fuzzy feeling. It's, it's quite sexy, to be honest. You know, I own five properties or I own three properties and it, it does make you feel wealthy. And yes, if, if you've invested in property, you may have done extremely well, particularly after the last couple of years. So it's what we call a tangible asset. The other great thing about property is if you have a decent size deposit and of course you you know, meet all the serviceability requirements, the bank are pretty happy to lend you large amounts of money to be able to acquire that asset or and that property asset or even more property assets. And they're very happy to leverage against property. If you apply for to buy another investment property and you already own a couple, you're putting city sitting pretty strong. You're in a pretty position because the banks love loaning against bricks and mortar. The other thing is property can be also quite tax effective, legally tax effective, because obviously you've got deductions, you know, all those holding costs. And there are people out there who, of course, you know, use negative gearing when it comes to property where the cost or the loss of owning that property can be claimed as a tax deduction. Now, shares do have some of these benefits as well. You've also got depreciation benefits. You know, the, the wear and tear of a property can also be or provide you with some really big and sexy and very valuable tax deductions, which, you know, may actually push you over the line and be able to get a tax refund or a very big tax refund. And the other really great thing about property is it's a consistent cash flow. Most landlords or most tenants pay their rent monthly. So you can con collect your passive income each month, kind of like a, a salary that you don't have to get out of bed and earn, which again is, is very convenient, very flexible and, and quite sexy, let's be honest. And then of course, it is pretty easy to control, well, reasonably easy to control or add value, or I guess you could say improve the performance of your investment properties. I remember, um, you know, things, little things like, especially with, with Tom's property, we just repainted it, uh, gave it a, 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 invested a bit of money, like sprucing it up a bit. And we were, and the rent was able to go up by quite a substantial amount. You know, I've uh, heard of people like doing, going through fresh paint, fresh carpet, uh, fresh tapware, little things around, and they've been able to put their rent up quite substantially as well. All those little things, you do have, you know, the ability to add value sometimes with properties. I've also seen situations where people have bought, for example, like a studio apartment, a large studio apartment, they've converted it into a one bedroom apartment and been able to get a lot more uh, it's grown in value because it's now considered a one bedroom instead of a studio and they get a lot more rent. So there is an ability, I guess, to add value and take a little bit more control when it comes to property. So 
you know, property is a, it's a very easy asset to understand. Most people get it pretty quickly. There's a, there is, of course, now the cons of property. There is the bitch of stamp duty. And yes, there is always, you know, potential talks of legislation changing stamp duty. And of course, you can now, for some people, uh, they may qualify to be able to pay their stamp duty off over a course of, you know, a certain amount of years, which I will do a second, a separate episode on. But stamp duty is a big killer. You really need to factor that into your numbers and obviously talk to the bank about how you're going to afford to pay stamp duty. It's a killer. It makes jumping in and out of property, particularly if you have an interest in flipping property, it makes it expensive and you have to be very mindful of that cost and very mindful of obviously the short-term volatility in the market because, for example, I know someone who bought a house and not that long ago and now they're thinking of selling it, but they actually can't afford to sell it because they've paid so much money in stamp duty and, and the area that they bought has dropped in value and they would be basically flushing all that stamp duty down and selling the property for far less than what we paid it for. So you do need to take into consideration how much you've paid in stamp duty when you're running your numbers, particularly when it comes to investments. The other thing is, and this is something a lot of people don't talk about when it comes to investment property and how well they've done with, invest with their properties and investment properties, is the holding costs of properties. You see, you have strata levies, you have insurances, you have council rates, you have water bills, and if you have issues with your building, you might get a special strata levy. I will never forget, and this would have been about uh, nine years ago, I got a special strata levy on my investment property for $23,000. And it was due in three weeks time. You know, it, it, that can be a real killer. And that's why I say these two asset classes may not be for everyone. You really need to understand what the risks and responsibilities lie behind holding these two different asset classes. So if you did get a special strata levy or the strata levy suddenly increased quite dramatically because they had to, you know, fill the, 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 uh, the sinking funds, you need to kind of be informed and aware and know that it's okay, I can actually still factor that in if it does happen or not. So there are those holding costs. And I'll tell you what, I'm talking from personal experience here because I own investment properties. Those holding costs are a little bit of a bitch. They really do eat into your passive income stream. And to be honest, they've made, from this is to me talking from personal experience and advice, uh, it makes it a little bit frustrating and annoying, you know, when you get those bills and you have to pay them and you look at how much they eat into your bottom line and that passive income that you're desperately trying to grow. It's annoying. The other thing is land tax. Now, this is not relevant and applicable to everyone because you only trigger land tax when you get over a certain threshold. And it is an annual cost. So again, that's another ongoing cost that might come out of your, your profit margin and your passive income. And I will never forget talking to this girl. She wasn't a client of mine, but she was like, she was asking me questions. She was kind of just like kind of picking my brain. And I, I and I, she said something. I was like, yeah, but you'd probably be having to pay land tax and all of that. And she was like, what are you talking about? What's that? And I was like, well, how can you not know about this? You've, you've owned these properties for many, many, many years. And her face was just like, oh my God, I don't know anything about it. She quickly spoke to her accountant a few weeks later, contacted me and said, oh my God, this was completely missed. And she actually had to go back and pay years of like unpaid land tax on her investment property portfolio, which was a nasty, nasty shock. And of course, I'm sure she sorted through all of that okay. But again, you need to know what you're dealing with and what you're doing if, with these types of assets because asset classes, they are big. There's a lot of risk and responsibility that lands on your shoulders, which is why I'm all about educational. Okay, the next thing is property is not a liquid asset. If I own, say, you know, a couple of investment properties and I suddenly need $10,000 and stupidly I don't have, say, enough emergency money or my emergency money doesn't cover it, I can't go and just sell the front door or sell one bedroom from that three-bedroom house. I'd have to sell the whole entire thing if I needed money quickly. And that, of course, then would trigger capital gains tax. So I'd also be paying, not only be selling like marketing fees and 
the commissions to a real estate agent, I'd also be paying money to the ATO. So if you are going to have an, you know, if you choose this type of asset class for yourself, make sure you have liquidity elsewhere because it certainly won't come from this asset class. So keep that in mind. The other thing is, you know, property is expensive to get in on top of stamp duty. You know, the whole research period, you know, doing strata searches and, and getting solicitors involved and looking at contracts. You may not even be successful in the, you know, in securing that property, but you still have to pay for certain sort of research and investigation. So that's part of the searching process. And then of course, there's your time in looking for, in, you know, property, you know, pounding the pavement uh, each Saturday, uh, driving around, looking at all these investment properties, your, your time is money. So you need to obviously factor that in as well. You know, and I, like a friend of mine just missed out on a couple of properties and each time they've had to spend quite a bit of money dealing with solicitors who have looked over the contracts for them, uh, getting strata reports and doing strata searches and really doing a lot of investigation when, that they've had to pay for themselves. And they've missed out on those those few properties and that cost really can add up but that's part of the game you have to accept that and that's again why you need to know these things the other thing with investment properties whether it be rural residential industrial or commercial is there is a risk when you are in between tenants there are some particular times of the year where you do not want a tenant moving out and this is coming coming from experience times like christmas time easter school holidays can also be a bit of a bitch uh January as well, particularly in like if you're in obviously the southern hemisphere and it's particularly hot, no one wants to be moving house in January. Most people are on holidays then and it's incredibly hot, it's ex exhausting. So that's something you also need to think about. In the area that we live in, for example, we live, I live in Tamarama Beach and we're right next to Bondi. Bondi rent market apparently is atrocious in winter time. It's a great time if you're a tenant because you can get you know, great value on your rent if you're looking to, to move, but it's really hard to rent properties out in those winter months in Bondi. So when you are in between tenants, it's expensive. Uh, it is, I remember my, uh, one of my investment properties was empty for like, I think four and a half, maybe five weeks. And first couple of weeks, I was like, okay, this sucks, but we'll get someone, we'll get someone. I was trying to be positive, but another week passed and then another week passed and I had to start dropping the rent and I had to start dropping the rent a few times to finally get a tenant in there. Now that is, and not only did I, my rent go backwards, which is an important component. I want to talk to you about that growing passive income streams. And it went back to the equivalent of what it was a couple of years ago. It, in the meantime, whilst that property was sitting empty, without any tenants paying me rent, I had to fund that gap, that difference. So I was having to pay the, basically the rent on that property so that I can continue on paying the principal and interest repayment on that particular property. Now, just so you know, I set up our investment loans, like I treat them like a principal and interest loan. And again, that's I mentioned that it's not personal advice. This is based on my own personal experience so I can help build up buffers with, with, with our investment strategy. So that's a bit of a killer. And if you have a couple of properties and they happen to overlap where they say a couple are empty at the same time, that can be a real killer. And that could really put you in a, in a dangerous situation where you may start defaulting on your mortgage repayments. Because remember, no tenants paying, you are still responsible for those repayments. So again, this is why you, it's important to understand this so that you build a what if in your emergency money that covers and factors that risk in there and helps safeguard those assets because these are long-term assets, okay? The other thing is, is it can be quite hands-on, even if you have a, a property manager. Now, there have been times in my life where I've managed my investment properties and there have been times in my life where I've used a property manager. Yeah, I, I like a property manager, mm, I just, I struggle to see the value sometimes in them, but because often they'll end up calling you and asking you what you think or what do you want to do or, and yes, they might organize things for you, but they charge a fee. And that again comes out of the ongoing costs of these asset classes. So 
property can still be quite hands-on. You might need to go and inspect the property. There might be an issue or a drama. Uh, you might need to approve certain things, uh, especially wear and tear, or maybe if, if the property manager said you need to do this and that. Uh, you know, for example, you might have to do some sort of inspection, like a fire report inspection. It's not as passive necessarily as a lot of people would think. You just sit there collecting rent each month. No, sometimes you have to go and inspect the properties. And particularly if your investment property is in another state or, you know, far away, you've got to factor in the cost of traveling to see that property. And yes, that might be tax deductible for you, but these are all things that you need to factor in because they come out of your passive income stream. And then finally, and this is, by the way, just so you know, I'm not going through absolutely everything. These are the top line pros and cons. There are, we'd be here all day. The other thing is property is really hard to diversify. It takes so long to get into the market. Really, if you're, you know, going one at a time, there's, you don't have much diversification. Most of your money is tied up in that one apartment or that one house. And that one house is sitting in that one street, in that one suburb, in that one area, in that one state. So you are really relying upon the performance and the, I guess, the desirable area that you've bought into in that one property. Yes, of course, you can diversify. You can buy one property in this area and that street and that suburb and that state and that country even. You can diversify, but that takes time. And, it, you know, it's, it's a process. It's a journey. But you, so you have to know initially you may have no diversification in your investment portfolio and in your investment strategy. So there you go. You've got the pros and cons of property. Next, I'm going to talk to you about shares and the pros and cons of shares. So just hold on for just a second while we have this quick break. I'll be right back. Now, welcome back. We are now moving on to the pros and cons of shares. And to be really honest, I had so many pros just flowing from me when I was doing the shares and a very small list of cons, interestingly. But we will come back to my opinions and experiences towards the end of this episode. All right, well, let's get cracking with the pros. All right, shares were really easy to get in the market. It's not like a property where you have to save up like tens or sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars to just get your foot in the door and get going. Shares you can buy if you're buying, you know, on a standard platform, not a micro investing platform, you can buy as little as $500. Okay, so that's it's great. It means you're, you're moving, you're cooking with gas. You can, you can build up from that $500 quite quickly, especially if you're motivated. The next thing is, is it franking credits? And this is a big one because this is going to, I'm going to explain about this more so how important this is towards the end. So make sure you listen all the way through for this episode. But franking credits are essentially dividends paid with after-tax after tax profits, okay? So you basically are receiving rent that has already had its tax paid on you and you get to keep that as a tax credit. It's really, really valuable, particularly to retirees, to be honest. So they come with these very sexy ranking credits, which are very, very valuable over the long run and both, I guess, in the immediate as well. The other thing is there's low cost to entry. So really, you're pretty much going to pay brokerage and there are lots of very competitive brokerage platforms out there. You know, you can, there's a whole pile of them. They're all very, very similar. And you just, you can do your research as to which one is right for you. But brokerage can vary between $8 to $18. And of course, it, there, it changes and starts to increase if you're doing very, very large chain tra trades because it reverts from a flat dollar amount to obviously a percentage amount. The other thing is shares are very liquid. You can literally sell your shares in two, three working days. You'll have that money in your bank account. Now, if that property, for example, if I needed $10,000 and I had no $10,000, I'd be forced to sell that property, pay a whole pile of exit costs, and then, of course, pay CGT. With shares, if I need $10,000 with shares, I can sell $10,000 Monday to Friday as long as the market is open, and I'll have that $10,000 quickly. Also, from a capital gain tax perspective, I'm not triggering, triggering a huge amount of capital gains tax on the, own, on, the, on the entire portfolio. I'm just triggering the $10,000 worth of capital gains tax on that particular trade. So my tax CGT implications will be, they're still there, but they'll be a lot smaller, a lot more manageable in, in order to obviously maintain that liquidity. Now, it goes without saying, you need to have emergency money and you need to take into consideration this liquidity risk. But shares are liquid. It's something it's got that the property doesn't have. The next thing is, is 
shares, if you're using a long-term buy and hold approach, you know, like kind of the Warren Buffett uh, passive income style, and you're using something like listed investment companies or ETFs or index funds, they are pretty passive. They're pretty hands-off because you're outsourcing all the heavy lifting, you know, the complicated, the confusing, the overwhelming financial decisions as to what companies to be investing in and when and how and do we buy it all in one hit or do we slowly and steadily buying it over time that's all outsourced so if you're including shares in your investment strategy perhaps using things like ETFs listed investment companies and index style funds within your risk profile parameters that can obviously help be a lot more passive in comparison to investment properties the other thing is shares are really easy to diversify. For example, you might have $500 to invest and you might buy a bank. But then when you have another 500000 uh, another $500 to invest, you might go and buy a supermarket and then you get another $500 to invest and you might invest in a transportation company. You can very quickly diversify your portfolio. The other option of course, if you're using an ETF or a listed investment company, it's immediately diversified because quite often that's why they're listed investment companies and why they're ETFs or why they're index funds is because they've pretty much bought the market. So even if you bought $500 worth of a listed investment company, your money is already instantly diversified, which helps reduce your risk and your short, short to medium term volatility. The other thing is it's you've got no holding costs. You know, I might own shares in a bank and I'm not going to get a, a monthly or a quarterly bill because I have shares in that bank. No, I get given money. I don't give them money. I, and, and this is what I love about shares is there are no holding costs. It, they aren't taking out of my bottom line like my investment properties are. They're not eating away into how much profit I'm making. They're not holding me back and growing my mindful money number. No, what I get other than obviously tax, I get to keep it. I get to add it to my growing passive income stream. So there's not really any holding costs. The other thing is, is quite often, or sometimes, not quite often, I should say sometimes, you might get opportunities to buy more of that stock in that company at a discount. For example, if you're setting up a dividend reinvestment plan, sometimes, not always, companies might allow a sl small discount on the current share price at that time where you can pick up more stock and there's there's different ways of this actually happening other than a drp but that's for another time for another episode and the other cool thing with with shares is and this is the the last top line thing and it is really easy to reinvest you see when i grew the thousand dollar project which is still growing today and is worth i last time i checked about two hundred fifty thousand dollars. how cool is that or like my dividends reinvest okay my personal ones at the moment don't reinvest because they're helping rebuild our emergency money but the thousand dollar project ones and the thousand dollar project portfolio i look as an educational tool is actually reinvesting so without even me having to add a thousand dollars when i can to buy more stock my dividends buy more dividends within that sorry my dividends buy more stocks within that company okay so for example, I might, might own a supermarket and that supermarket paid me say $800 in dividends for the financial year. Instead of taking that $800 and spending it, I've actually used that $800 to buy more stock in that particular supermarket. Now, of course, yes, I do need to declare that in my tax return because that is income that I have technically received even though I've chosen to reinvest it. But don't forget, it also comes with those sexy franking credits that are really valuable. And of course, not all companies pay franking credits, typically industrial ones, but it's very, 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 very powerful and very, very beneficial for my personal goals and my personal strategy. So the cool thing about it is it's very easy to reinvest. Not all companies have automatic dividend reinvestment strategies, but ones that do, and it works for you and your goals, keeping in mind diversification, you've got to keep your finger on the pulse with that because you can, over time, you can be over leveraged in one particular industry or one particular company than others it's pretty easy you can't reinvest with property your rent can't go back into back into that property it's really about a really powerful particularly if you're taking a hands-off long-term approach all right so let's move on to the cons and this will be shorter and sweeter because in my personal opinion and experience there aren't quite as many but again we're just doing top line so this isn't a limited list so the cons is, and this is one that annoys me a lot, I'll be honest, 
And that is you get your dividends typically every six months. I wish companies would pay their dividends every month like they do with properties. I feel like so many more people would jump into the share market knowing they've got this consistent, this income stream that was coming in every month rather than having to wait every six, six months. I feel like that turns a lot of people off. And I will, if you've ever read my book, Mindful Money, I actually have a strategy behind this called the two year sleep well strategy, which is typically for retirees. But it's essentially where you have two years worth of living expenses to help manage that cash flow of only being paid every six months. So there are ways around it. And of course, you can always drip feed yourself that income stream on a monthly basis where you have like a catchment account where all those dividends are paid every six months and then it would drip feed you and pay you like a salary out of that account every month. So there are, even though it's a con and there are ways around it, it's an important frustration. It's one that even personally annoys me. The other thing is shares. Whilst they're considered to be a high growth asset, which they most definitely are, the, the thing with shares is, they appear way more volatile than what they are. And that's simply because we can see the share price at any minute of the day of our investments. And we can see if we log into our investment banking, into our portfolio accounts, and we can see if we you know, log in one hour later, the market's moved again. So it can, I guess, heighten your, sens your sensitivity towards looking at the volatility of your portfolio. We never can see the true value of our property online. There's no stock market to show what the value of our apartment is or the value of our townhouse or the value of our home is worth every minute, every second of the day. So it can, I guess, really heighten that sensitivity and, and uh, an awareness. And that's something I think, is, again, it's very, very important with not checking your portfolio throughout the day or even necessarily every day, because you can end up getting letting your emotions get involved and make knee jerk reactions that may come with regret. And of course, you know, with shares, there's no control over the returns. You can't like your investment property, give it a fresh like, lick of paint and a new carpet and maybe put in, you know, air conditioning or something like that. You can't like add, do quick fix, add values to control the returns. Really, the returns are subject to the, you know, the success of that fund manager that you've used or that listed investment company or how you've picked your own stocks. So there's limited control over the returns. And again, that's why diversification is so important. And that's why listed investment companies and ETFs can be very powerful within the parameters of your risk profile. All right, so which asset class is right for you? Now, I can't answer that for you because of course, you need to get advice from a financial planner that actually looks at your personal situation, looks at your personal circumstances, looks at your dreams, your goals, and your deadlines, and, and looks over your risk profile and works with you just to confirm that your risk profile is actually correct because your risk profile can actually change over time. But whilst I can't tell you what asset class is right for you, there are a couple of things I can get you thinking about that will help you when you do turn up and see a financial planner, you turn up educated and informed, and you will actually hopefully find that you're able to get advice quicker and get that advice implemented quicker because you know and understand exactly what you're doing and you are on your way. So this is what I recommend you do. Start thinking about what your goal actually is. I know my goal is passive income driven. I want to grow a passive income stream of $200,000 a year, a growing passive income stream. So again, reminding you about that importance of that income going up, those dividends going up year after year after year, or for example, that investment property rent growing year after year after year. So think about your goals. Is yours like mine? Do you like the sound of having a mindful money number? If you do, you should read mindful money as you're going through this process and make sure you read that before you go and see a financial planner. The other thing is you might go, no, I want to, I want to make, I want to make quick money. I want to flip stocks or I, I want, sorry, I want to flip properties or I want to trade shares. I want to be jumping in and out and making quick money. If that's what you want to do, that's perfectly fine. But you need to think about what is your goal? What do you really want to do? The other thing is you need to be thinking about time frame. These asset classes, as I mentioned, are high growth asset classes. They are for the long run, okay? I'm not an advocate of taking huge amounts of risk to try and make a quick dollar. It's not who I am. It's, it's, it's not my, my ethos. I'm all about long-term growing passive income streams. I'm a long-term buy and hold investor. I reinvest my income when I can. I, try, I contribute to the portfolio and I use educated, very sensible and wise gearing in my own personal strategy within very strict boundaries. 
But these type of assets are long term. And when I say long term, I'm talking 10 years plus. So you might have a goal of building up passive income, but you might say, well, I've only got five years to do this. That's you need more time than that. So please be aware of that. And that's when you talk to a financial plan, look at what the alternatives are. The other thing is, what is your risk profile? As I said, these asset classes can belong in your portfolio, but you need to work out how much of your money is tied up in these types of assets. I am personally a high growth investor. So for my asset class recommendation for a high growth investor, and you can literally Google it and we'll come out now, we'll put it in the podcast notes, a great calculator to help you with this. But for me being a high growth investor, a large component of my recommended portfolio should be in international shares, Australian shares and property because I have time. I have my time frame is long. It's actually 20, 30, 40 years. And I'm very comfortable with short to medium term market volatility. So it's essential that you know your risk profile. And I will link that risk profile calculator that will help you work out what your profile is. The other thing you need to be thinking about is what makes you feel comfortable, but knowledgeably comfortable. As I said in the beginning of this episode, so many people just go with the simplest and most easy to understand investment and just stop at that. For example, they will go, well, I get property. I'm just going to go with that because I understand it. That's not, that's fine, but that's not good enough. You should still explore shares because once you understand shares, you might actually go, you know what? Shares are actually really good too. I need to add this as part of my strategy. And one thing I should also point out, you know, someone who might come out as seeing a balanced investor from a risk profile, that doesn't mean you wouldn't invest in these types of assets. It just means you maybe would have a smaller percentage of your money tied up in these types of aggressive assets. So it's not like you're in and you're out. You can actually still have these types of asset class, but in a, a smaller percentage. My percentage, as I said, as a high growth investor is much higher than say a balanced investor's exposure would really be. So as I said, don't just stop at what is easy to understand. That's lazy. You want to make sure that you understand all the different asset classes so you know which one is right for you. But also by knowing all the different asset classes, you'll know when times change and you need to change or add different and new asset classes to your portfolio, particularly if diversification and trying to reduce volatility is something that's really important to you. So learn all the different asset classes before you decide. Don't get lazy and just stop at the one that's easy to understand because it may not necessarily actually be the best one for you and your goals. And then finally, how flexible can you really be? Okay. Now you don't have to stick with one asset class and then just get, use that one for life. Your financial situation, and I'm talking from professional experience now, will evolve and change over time. I am a financial planner and my client's financial strategies, I've been doing this for almost 20 years. Their financial strategies have evolved and changed. They've had children, they've had separations, uh, they've had health changes. They've had wealth accumulation opportunities. They've had great success financially. Their situation has evolved and changed and grown and their assets and their investment portfolio has had to evolve with them. So how flexible are you really? Maybe you want to start with shares first to help start getting you on that path where you start seeing that passive income and feeling it and seeing how it works for you. And then further down the track, maybe you want to start including investment properties and that might be industrial, commercial, rural, residential. How flexible can you be? Or maybe you want to flip it the other way and go, you know what? I just want to get my foot in the door with the, the property market. I will grow and go from there. I'll start with property and then I'll look at adding a share portfolio in further down the track. And I will point out the cool thing about property is, and again, not advice, the banks, as I said, really love lending against property. And there is something called debt recycling where you can potentially over the long run, if you've got all this money and it's tied up in property, but you want to start building up a share portfolio, there are strategies where you can actually use the equity within those properties to go and borrow money, which is very risky. And you must, must, must go and get professional advice before doing something like this. But you can extract and take a loan against those properties, which obviously puts those properties at risk, but then use that to go and buy and build other asset classes, such as shares, and add an element or further element of diversification into your portfolio. And that's one of the benefits of property because banks do that. The frustrations, and this is where I really want to go into now, is my, I guess, my final thoughts for the day on these two different asset classes. This is what annoys me the most about property. Sorry, this is what actually annoys me the most about shares, but you get the benefit of property. So if I might have, say, $10 million worth of 
shares, which I don't. I wish I did. That would be really nice. But if I was to go to the bank, they don't really care that much about my share portfolio. They're not going to go and lend me another $10 million against a $10 million share portfolio necessarily. But if I turned up to the bank and said, I've got $10 million worth of property, they are so much more willing and able to help me in borrowing money. Because they, as I said, they love lending against bricks and mortar. And that really annoys me because if you don't own property, and you want to build up a great share portfolio, the system is a little bit backwards in that it doesn't actually help you if you want to include a very responsible and informed and wisely managed gearing strategy such as a margin loan. So you can't necessarily access the right as, as many opportunities or access enough capital to borrow to invest to help build your wealth at the level perhaps that you would like. You're really capped and limited as to how much you can borrow. For example, some margin loan providers will only lend you up to 50% or 60% or 75% and that will be subject to the type of stocks that are in your portfolio and that's limited to what their approved list is of lending criteria. So it can be really restrictive and limiting when you're really trying to build wealth. And that doesn't mean don't use that asset class. Just be aware of it because you need to work around it. Maybe you need to invest more or you have to save more to invest. Like you, you can work. There are ways around it. But that's my, my frustration with shares. And it's not so much a frustration with shares, but it's probably a frustration with the system and the banking system and their pers perspective when they look at lending money for this type of asset class. And the funny thing is, I might have say a million dollars in a bank and I go to that particular bank and say, I wanna borrow a couple of hundred thousand dollars to buy some shares. And they say, well, where are your assets? And I go, well, I only have a million dollars worth of shares, but guess what? That million dollars shares is actually in your own bank. They don't have the same approach and attitude in lending and I won't be able to borrow as much if then if then if I was to turn up with saying, oh, well, I own this million dollar investment property outright with no debt on it, how much money can I borrow? They'll lend me a lot more because I can they'll they have the security of that property, even though it's a million dollars shares in that particular bank. That frustrates me a lot and annoys me. And the other thing that then annoys me is the loan size. Sorry, the the percentage, the, the interest rate charge on a loan. If I look at my loans which are secured against my properties. It's a hell of a lot cheaper than if I look at, for example, the margin loan that is on the $1,000 project. It's a couple of percentage difference, which when you're talking big amounts of money, which we're not because the $1,000 project is very conservatively managed, it's an annoying frustration that they will charge so much more to borrow money to buy shares, particularly when they're secured against the shares versus borrowing money secured against a property. That really, really annoys me. So what is my bottom line? All right, at the end of the day, when I look at, I do my tax return and I, I, I have an accountant who helps me, but I, I send them through an Excel spreadsheet with, with the summary to make it as quick and as easy as possible. And I look at how much rent I have collected and, and then I deduct all the ongoing expenses of that property. And I look at the, the bottom line, the net profit, the net passive income from the properties. Then I just like scuttle on over to my share portfolio and add up all the dividends I've received from my shares. And I look at the two asset classes and I look at what they're worth, the, what the property portfolio is worth. And I look at what the share portfolio is worth. And every single time I have done this and I've been a long-term investor. And again, this is not personal product advice whatsoever. I'm talking about my personal insights, which is subject to the investments that I made, the timing and and the process of the growth. When I look at the two asset classes, my share portfolio is smaller and technically worth less, but it pays me more passive income than my bigger property portfolio. And when I look at that from an efficiency point of view, and I have new money going forward, and I'm trying to build a $200,000 a year passive income stream, this one is far more efficient for me. It seems to need less money to build more income. And when I look at the passive income in previous years, and this is my big thing about growing passive income, that two-dimensional component, my property 
income stream is not as profitable every single year because there are times where I'm in between tenants. My new tenant isn't going to pay the same amount of rent that the previous tenant paid. Um, I've had special strata levies or the strata levies have gone up or uh, the insurance costs have gone up. Sometimes passive income from property may not necessarily grow at the same rate as an Australian share portfolio that includes industrial shares. So going forward for me, I like shares. I, I love the liquidity of shares. I'm a long-term investor of shares, but I also understand and I'm very comfortable that they're a long-term investment. They have risk and they're incredibly volatile. That's fine by me. So for me, when I look at what my end goal is, the fact that I'm a high growth investor, the fact that I have time behind me and I am so extremely motivated and driven to grow this passive income stream from an efficiency perspective, for me, shares are right for my strategy. And for me, I'll be definitely focusing a lot of my energy on building up that side of my you know wealth accumulation strategy over the long run. So I'm not necessarily getting in and out of certain things, but I definitely, for me, that's where my sweet spot sits. That's where I can see great progress. And as I always say to people, progress fuels success. When I sit down at the end of the financial year and I look at my passive income and I add it up and I see how we are tracking to our anchor spot, which is the $200,000 a year mindful money number, then we're getting closer and closer. And what's getting us closer and closer at a much faster rate, for me, it is my Australian share portfolio of industrial shares. Again, a reminder, that is not product strategic or investment advice to go out and start investing in industrial shares. That is obviously my successes are subject to the timing of me buying that stock, how long I've been in the market and which particular stocks I actually picked. So please don't think that this is advice because it certainly isn't. And that is why you need to go and see a stockbroker and get advice or see a financial planner and get advice or do your own research and build your own portfolio and strategy behind it. But that what I really want to make you aware of is that importance of growing passive income stream. Can you look at your investment property or investment properties and can you look at your shares and go, all right, these are all growing every single year. So can you look at your investment property or investment properties or your share portfolio and ask yourself, are the passive income streams organically growing year after year so that I know that this passive income stream is going to not only keep up with inflation, but exceed it so that it gives me sustainable financial freedom and independence. That is my question to you guys. And that is why it is so incredibly important that you understand the concept of two dimensional assets that pay you a growing passive income because I want you to have sustainable financial freedom and independence. All right, everyone. Sorry, that was a much longer podcast than I had hoped, but I hopefully you know it was well worth it. It was full of lots of transparent, independent insights and of course, education to help make sure that you feel more confident and secure as to what you decide when it comes to building your own financial freedom and independence. All right, everyone, please make sure you are subscribed and following this podcast. And of course, you are tuned in every Wednesday morning on How Do They Afford That, where Michael and I take a bit more of a relaxed pace to have a bit of a laugh and talk about what's going on in the world of personal finances and what people are doing to be able to afford that. All right, everyone. Ciao for now.